This is Missing Peace, part number two, the series focused on Luke chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. This is the uh, foundational scripture. This is where the angels speaking to the shepherds in the field in Bethlehem, the announcement of Jesus, it says, and suddenly there was with them the angel, the angel, a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And so the announcement of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, at the same time that that took place, so was the announcement of peace. Again, it says, um, glory to God in the highest on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And so with Jesus comes peace. And so I have a question for you. How many of you, just raising your hands, how many of you have somebody in your life that is difficult to love? Right? Now, if that person is in this room, don't raise your hands. Just look at me with a fiery intensity in your eyes that says, Brother, they're sitting right next to me, all right? We all have people that are difficult to love. In fact, the message title I have today is help. These people are driving me crazy. We all have them, and it's ramped up during the holiday season, right? We just got done with Thanksgiving. We have all the Christmas stuff coming up or holiday stuff at work. Whatever it is, we have family members that we don't normally talk to. In fact, we avoid like the plague all year long, but now we have to see them face to face. We have coworkers and our own stresses and people at church and school and all these things that are going on, and all of it involves people. Help, these people are driving me crazy. So if we're talking about missing peace, the peace that so oftentimes is missing in our lives, we can't talk about that without bringing up the fact that people are giant peace suckers out of our lives oftentimes. They just drain every bit of peace that we have. And I believe that God wants us to, to walk in his peace, which is miraculous. It's, it's not something you can force or make up or pretend in. You can pretend for a while, but eventually that falls apart. There is a heavenly divine peace that he has for us, yes, even in our relationships. The reality is we live in an age of perpetual offense. We are quick to anger. We are quick to judgment. We are quick to cancel. We, it, it seems like more and more every group of people, and in all the different ways that you would slice and divide, every group of people is more and more offended year after year. And the reality is, you will find, eventually, what you're searching for. And so many people don't even realize it. I'm talking about Christians. Not, I'm not talking about people that don't know the Lord. Oftentimes, us as believers... We are looking to be offended, and we don't even realize it. And most of us will probably raise our hand and say, no, I don't want to be offended. I, these people drive me nuts. I don't, I'm not looking for offense. But the way that we live our lives and the way that we manage or don't manage our thought life would say otherwise. We would say publicly, no, I never want to be offended. I don't go looking for a fight. But the way that we live our lives in, in the practical would uh, speak to something totally different. It is, you got to realize that offense is inevitable. You're going to be offended. There's going to be things that offend you, that you can't control that. There's things that are said and done around you all the time that will bring offense to you. So offense is inevitable, but living offended is a choice. I'll say that again. The offense is inevitable, but living offended is a choice. And stop right there. We could stop the whole message right there. If you believe in your heart that whatever comes your way, you have to fully absorb it, and you are completely a victim to it, this message is going to drive you insane. Because I'm going to push against that. Offenses are inevitable. They're going to come. And you're going to feel offended. It's not wrong, by the way, when something offensive takes place for you to feel offended. But there's a difference between feeling the offense 
and living offended. There's the moment where you feel it, where like, wow, that's not right. They should not have said that. That's not how you should act. The offense happens, but, and you respond to that, but living in a perpetual state of you being offended by that is a choice. I can say this story because my wife is in Costa Rica, thousands and thousands of miles away, <laughs> and she can't do anything about it. So... My wife is very particular about certain things in our house. And um, every once in a while, I unload the dishwasher. I like to wash dishes, but I can't stand unloading the dishwasher. I don't know what it is. For me, putting the dishes away, I may as well have to go mow the yard seven times in a row before I do that. I just can't stand putting dishes away. I like washing dishes, not putting them away. And so every once in a while, when I put the dishes away, um, almost every time, not always, but almost she gives me a hard time about how I put the dishes away, which I didn't realize you could do wrong, but apparently you can. So I get a little, I will say, I get a little bit lazy about it. The dishes that happen to have a little bit of water on them, I usually don't dry them. I just kind of put them away. And that's what she calls me out on. Like, you're supposed to dry those. What are you doing? And in my mind, I'm offended at that. I'm like, well, at least I'm putting the dishes away. Right, like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't do it perfect. I don't say that, obviously. I'm like, yes, honey. But internally, I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Well, then you put the dishes away. Offense. I'm offended by that, but do I choose to be offended in my life about that, or do I choose to let that go? Choose to forgive, choose to say, you know, it's okay. It's not, it's not worth it. It's not, not worth it in the sense of, ah, I'll just give up on it. But it's not worth it because I value my relationship more than being right. And so we are always presented with offense. That's going to happen and you will feel offense. But are you living in a perpetual state of being offended? That's an important question that you have to answer. So we're going to be in Romans chapter 12 for the rest of this message. Go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 14 and 15. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. So the last part, rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Or in other words, being connected with other people. When you have loved ones or, or people that are around you that maybe you don't even know, when they're going through something difficult, read the room. If they're hurting, love on them, minister to them, mourn with them. Don't just, be, don't just pretend like it doesn't exist. Be there in the moment with them. If they're rejoicing, there's something great going on in their lives, rejoice with them. Be thankful and praise with them. But the first part is the difficult one. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. The Greek word for bless means to speak well of, to praise, to bless, and to pass. And so to bless somebody means that you choose internally and externally to speak well about that person. Now, I was always raised and told, if you have something, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. You guys, you guys ever raised with that? It's not quite the golden rule, but it's got to be up there. It's got to be like a silver somewhere in that range. If you have nothing nice to say, then don't say anything else at all. So to that point, I actually would say that that's a flawed perspective. Because the Bible says that we are to bless those who persecute you, bless those and do not curse them. It says that we are to speak well of them. Well, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to say they're a great person when they're not. So I'm not going to be a, a liar. But at the same time, we internally, the internal conversation that goes on in our mind and externally, we can still speak good things to and about anybody. I think of the people that in my life have hurt me the most. I know in those moments there are still good things that I can speak over that person. And even, even if, if it's difficult to say that, at a minimum, I can speak godly things over that person. I can seek, speak scriptures over them. I can declare what God says about them. Even though they're acting terribly, I can say that they are chosen by God. They're loved by God. They are redeemed by God. They're a son or a daughter of God. So to speak well of somebody does not mean that you lie about them. It means that you will, A, speak about the good things that are in their life, 
And whether or not there are good things, at a minimum, you will always speak the word of God over their lives. You will speak into existence what may not be there in front of you. So to speak well of somebody is to bless them. And this, one of the meanings of the word for bless is to pass. It, it's to say, you know what? You, I have every right to hold you accountable. I have every right to light you up, to blow you up, to whatever word you want to use there. I could call you to task on this, but I'm choosing to give you a pass on this. Now, I know what some of you are thinking right away. Well, that's a license for them to continue to abuse me or for them to continue to lie, or for them to continue to hurt other people. We're going to dive into that because this is the wrestling that we have. In our minds, we would say oftentimes that if someone deserves it, then I'll bless them. But God is saying clearly, as they are persecuting you, as they're coming against you, think of this, it's not just I'm going to kill you because you're a Christian. That's how we think oftentimes of persecution or being a martyr. It's more than just a death threat because of you being a believer. What happens when someone betrays you? A deep, intimate relationship and they betray you. They stab you in the back. What happens when there's disagreements? Strong ones where you really disagree with what they're saying and what they're doing. Or they're being rude or hateful to you. They're being condescending, or maybe maybe they're being sarcastic towards you. They're gossiping about you. The list goes on and on and on. All of that is you being persecuted. All of that is someone coming against you. So it's not only a threatening of your life, but it is when you have people that are acting like your enemy, and they are in your life trying to hurt you. The word says that we are to bless those that persecute us. So in other words, when people least deserve our love, we are supposed to not just tolerate them or be quiet about them. We are to actually love them. This is so contradictory to what the rest of the world does. The rest of the world, if you deserve it, I will take care of you, be nice to you, and bless you. But God says it's the exact opposite. If you're going to be my follower, you're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you have to learn how to bless and minister to your enemy well. And don't give yourself a hall pass. Don't give your, let yourself off the hook where, well, I understand how hurt I've been and I know how bad they are, so God understands that I don't have to bless them anymore. God says to bless those that persecute you to speak well of them, to praise, to bless, to give them a pass. There is no expiration date, by the way, on this blessing. It's not that you do it once and it gets God off your back and now you never have to deal with that person again. It is a continual blessing, blessing. Well, that seems like I'm going to be abused. You know what? Let the Lord be your defender. But that means that lies will be able to run rampant and no one's going to tell the truth. Let the Lord be your defender. Do you trust that Jesus is going to uphold his truth more than you are able to do it? Do you trust that Jesus is going to be able to defend you in the best, right, healthy kind of way, better than what you can? We have to believe that God is more concerned about those things and is working on our behalf than maybe how we have lived that out up to this point. God is for you. He is with you. Now, I'm not saying that you don't speak truth. I'll I'll clarify that in a moment. We speak truth. We, in the right kind of way, call out darkness. But there's a right way and there's a wrong way of doing things. But you guys know what I mean when I talk about our enemies. We know, according to Scripture, that human beings are not our enemies. We know that Satan, his demons... The principalities, the power of of this present darkness is our enemy. It's the unseen. People happen to partner with that quite often, but they're human beings, flesh and blood. They are not our enemy. But this is what happens. I'm going to play out a little scenario for you. Let's say you're driving and you got this person that pulls up in a really fast, like 
pulling past you in a really fast sports car. And they're bobbing, weaving all over the place. They cut you off. You're like, come on. And there's, they're speeding. They just haul right past you, right? And then all of a sudden, a few miles down the road, you see that they got pulled over. In your mind, what are you thinking? Ha <laughs> ha! Sucker! You deserve that. You're getting what you deserve. You might even slow down as you drive by, get the look like, yeah, this is why you should be driving a minivan, right? So like in your mind, they're getting what they deserve. That's how we all are. Come on. If we're we're just being honest, right? That person that's a jerk at work, they get passed over for the promotion. Yes, right? That person that was talking junk about you, it finally comes back and bites them, and all of a sudden people start talking about them. <laughs> finally, they get what they deserve. Now, if you're not thinking that or you've never done that, wonderful. Go ahead and polish your little angel halo. You're perfect. We have reserved seating up in the front for you. God bless you. But for the rest of us human beings, that's what we think about. Our enemies, when they get what they deserve, <sighs> somehow we're built up when they're torn down. This Joking aside, is the exact opposite of how believers should act. And so when our mind runs wild and we let it go wherever we want to, we we laugh about it or we joke around about it, or in our mind, it's just, it's good that they have what they have. That's not godly. Because you don't even have to say anything to curse somebody. That's why the the old saying of, if if you don't have anything nice to say, then don't say anything at all. You can be completely silent and still in your mind be cursing that person. In fact, that's normally where cursing happens. First is in our mind. Continually is in our mind. Loudly is in our mind. You don't have to say a single word and still be ungodly towards somebody. And so it's it's a lesser truth to just stay quiet. In our lives, we are to bless. Internally, externally, we are to bless those that are acting as if they're our enemies, those that are persecuting us. Romans chapter 12, just going to the first verse, it says, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. That is your true and proper worship. Worship up here, this is worship that we had. It's a part of it. Musicians leading us in worship, it's a beautiful part of it. But God says over and over in his word that at the very boiled down basic heart matter of worship, our true spiritual act of worship is something that looks more like this, that we are living sacrifices, which kind of seems like a contradictory term to when we think of sacrifice, we think of something being killed. The Old Testament, they would sacrifice animals to cover up temporarily the sins of the people of God. And so a sacrifice is dead, but now Jesus comes on scene. He says, no longer am I interested in or do I want dead sacrifices. I want living sacrifices, which means you're still alive, but you're living for God. You are sacrificing what your knee-jerk reaction is. You're sacrificing what you want to do and say and what you want to see that other person go through. You are sacrificing that and you are choosing to live for God. Let me tell you right now, when that person passes you and they get pulled over, that split second where you go, ooh, that's kind of funny. It's not wrong in a moment to be tempted to think about those things. Temptations happen all the time. But what you do after that initial temptation in your life matters greatly. To be tempted to laugh at that person for getting pulled over is natural. That is a temptation that's there. And when it hits you, you're not a sinner because you are tempted in that second and in that moment. But what you do with that afterwards matters greatly. If you choose in that example, and of course you could apply that example across your entire life. If you choose in that example to just keep playing the reel over in your mind, let your mind wander and go down that messed up, twisted path and play that story out any way that you want to, you are walking in sin. 
But if you choose to say, I'm going to sacrifice that part of my life, and I'm going to choose to live for you as a living sacrifice, then you will say, you know what? Lord, I pray for that person that for whatever reason they were speeding, whatever reason that's going on right now, no matter what it is, Lord, I pray that you bless them, help them to get wherever they're going safely for the sake of them and other people. God, I pray that if there's an emergency or some other reason why they're doing that, God, that you would bring your peace into their life. You guys, I hope you're catching what I'm saying. There's a big difference between God, get them, and God, bless them. You guys seeing the difference? You see in the sin versus the living sacrifice. This is what we're called to. God is looking for living sacrifices. Think of those animals back in the Old Testament that would be sacrificed. Again, super thankful we don't have to do that anymore. A, disgusting. B, it would make these services really weird, right? First time visitors walk in and I'm up here just like slicing the neck of a goat or something like that. It would get awkward. We would probably lose a few people. Certainly wouldn't be able to do live stream. Peter would be all over that. And, but think of the animals. If they could talk and they could hear and understand, I can't imagine any of them would be like, sign me up. I volunteer to be the next one that you slaughter. No animal, no person would ever volunteer for that, which is why God's looking for living sacrifices for his followers to say every day, every moment, God, sign me up. I choose to volunteer. I choose to be a living sacrifice, starting with my thoughts, moving to my actions. Going back to Romans chapter 12, now the next verse, verse 16. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. So in this relational conversation about how we have peace from God to other people, it's saying that we should not be conceited and we cannot walk in pride. But see, the thing is, as believers, everything that we, should, everything that we do should be in the name of Jesus. We live and have our breath and have our purpose and our being in Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus is what we should be doing. But so many people, because of their pride, because they're conceited and they know everything about everything and they have life figured out, even though the funny thing is, is most people would say, I'm a sinner just like everybody else and I don't have life figured out. But then when they talk or when they post online or they interact with people they don't like, they act like they know everything and they have all knowledge. And so instead of being in the name of Jesus or in the name of Christ, how you live your life, it's more like I'm right in the name of science, even though few people can agree on what in the world science is actually saying. I love science. I think science is great. It's so important that we know how things operate. But even the word science is a dividing word. So for you to be right in the name of science uh, science. It's a dangerous thing. Here's why. Every time that you know you're right and that pride rises up on the inside of you and that you're conceited about it, you're automatically positioning your heart to torpedo that person out of the water. You're coming at them, guns blazing with I'm right because of science, or maybe it's because of news. I almost wrote down politics, but news and politics are basically synonymous with each other at this point. So because of my politics, because of my news, and the name of news, I am right. Or maybe it's this, in the name of my experience, this is what I've experienced. And so in the middle of an argument, I don't care what you have to say, in the name above all names, the name of my experience, this is what I know. I'm prideful in that. I'm conceited in that. Maybe it's in the name of Facebook, Right? I know it's not, Facebook's not the only one. There's TikTok, there's Instagram, all those things. But in the name of social media, I'm right. Again, it says, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. So pride is a dividing point and makes it so that we cannot live in harmony with other people. Pride, do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. That, I always thought that meant people that were just poor. It doesn't mean that. 
in your mind, the, the, the path that you're on, you believe you're heading the right direction. This is saying, be willing to associate with people that don't live like and think like you, that have a different perspective other than you, and do not be conceited. See, we know in John chapter 13, verse 35, it says that people will know that we are Jesus' disciples by how correct we are. Oh, I'm sorry, it doesn't say that. It actually says that they're going to know that we're his disciples by our love. And so what do we do in the middle of arguments, in the middle of confrontation? We have to educate that person, right? We have to show them the old school way of thinking or the new school way of thinking. We have to tell them why they're wrong and we're right. People will know that we're disciples of Jesus because of our correctness. That is not what the word tells us. People will know that we are God's disciples because of our love. And so are you more concerned about showing people the love of God or about them knowing how right you are and how wrong they are? So, or Proverbs chapter 19, verse 11 says, a person's wisdom yields patience. So when you have wisdom, the fruit of that is patience. It is to one's glory... Here it is, to overlook an offense. Put it this way. You can acknowledge what is wrong in this world, what is wrong in a relationship, what's wrong in this particular situation. You can acknowledge what is wrong without demanding justice. Let me say that again. You can acknowledge what is wrong without demanding justice. And here is where the rubber meets the road. For me, I watch the news. And I see what's going on in this community. And I see what's going on in schools and all that stuff. And there's certainly opinions that I hold. And I believe they're right. I have scriptures that point to it. And I believe that my thinking is correct, although I'm very open to other options and other opinions on some things. But even if I'm right and they're wrong, I can share in love truth with people without demanding that they agree, demanding that they apologize, demanding that they make it right, demanding that somehow they pay it back, demanding that they walk away from everything that they are and they do everything according to the gospel of Jerry Tice. You can communicate truth without demanding justice. And I know, oh my goodness, I know that kills us on the inside. Because if, if we don't demand justice, then liars are going to continue to succeed. Liars and the lies that they spew are going to continue to increase. And if we aren't going to be the warriors of truth, who is? Listen, the way you live your life speaks a thousand times louder than the truth that you're trying to communicate. In fact, I'll put it this way. If it's really true in your life, you'll live it out louder than you speak it out. And so for you... Let God be your defender. You live that truth, you speak the truth, but you don't have to demand that everyone believes the same way and that everyone bows down to how you believe it's interpreted because the reality is we could, I could be wrong on some things. And so let's present the love of God, the truth of God. Let's continue to point people to Christ, not ourselves, not our news, not our Facebook, not our experiences, not our opinions. Let's point people to Christ and let the Holy Spirit do in their life what only the Holy Spirit can do. So I'm not saying wave a flag and don't speak truth. Speak truth. But speak it and do it in love and let God deal with the rest. Let him handle the justice part of it. Let him handle the life change part of it, the application part of it. Don't try to do God's job. Focus on what you're supposed to be doing. That's enough work for the day in and of itself. I would say it this way. We start with patience. Remember, if you have wisdom, it produces patience. And so someone that is patient, what that says to me is they're, they're full of wisdom. Someone that's impatient, it does not have wisdom. Patience produces, or excuse me, wisdom produces patience. So we start with patience towards people. All the lies and ridiculousness and all the things that they say you're, that you just want to like, ah, scream at them. You're patient towards them. You're kind. You're loving towards them. Start with patience. 
and move towards the truth at the speed of trust. Start with patience. No matter who says what, love them, show patience towards them. And then slowly but surely, you start moving your life and your relationship and your conversation towards truth. But you do that at the speed at which you have trust with that person. That's one of the problems with news and with those things is you have people that have no relationship built up with you, no trust built up, just telling you how it is, reading you the laws and the rules. I'm much more willing to accept when I'm wrong when someone that is loving and consistent and patient in my life walks me to that place of truth. I'm much more willing to accept that because there's trust built into the relationship. And so just have patience with people. It shows how wise you are. And then as opportunities arise and as you build trust in that relationship, start talking about and moving more towards truth. Truth needs to be upheld. There's just a better way of doing it than screaming in the faces of people. There's a better way to share God's truth with with them. I have a story that I want to read to you guys. I actually have it here on the iPad. And I I have my pencil here because I actually have to uh, do some editing with it and kind of show you guys. Uh, You'll see on every page that I go to that there are certain parts of it that are marked up or that are missing. And I kind of want to just share this story with you. And, but the problem is, like, uh, look at this first right here. This is the title. This is the cover of it. And there's a part missing. All I see is Santa! But I don't know what that other word says. So all I can do is just kind of assume. And by looking at this photo, I'm going to say that the title of this book is Shifty Santa. Here's why. Look at those eyes. Those beady little eyes. He's up to something. I don't know what, but there's something going on. I think this, the title of this book is called Shifty Santa. Let me go and just take my eraser tool and see what it's actually called. Oh, it's Hurry Santa. My bad. I got that one wrong. Let's move on to the next one. All right, so here's the, oh, just open the book up. Let's keep reading that. All right, it says, hurry, no time to rest. Why? That's what I want to know. Why is there no time to rest? But first, I want this one question answered. Why is he wearing that? <laughs> this, is, this is church. Come on, modesty. So again, why does it say, hurry, no time to rest? What's Santa up to? Why is he not resting? Why, why is he, what is he doing? Look at this. I'm going to move this over here. Look at what he's doing in this sink. No adult man that I know of uses that much soap. So I want to know what he's making. I want to know what he's up to. This looks like drugs to me. He's making drugs. Look, it's blue. It's blue right there. This is Breaking Bad Santa right here. He, <laughs> this is your next door neighbor who's probably doing and making drugs. I don't like that. And look at this. His beautiful little cat begging and pleading with them, please stop. You're going to blow the house up. I don't know. I'm just saying he's in a hurry and there's no time to rest. Someone should look into this. Let's see what the uh, story says. Hurry, Santa. Okay. Again, reminder, he's Santa. And let's see what it says here. It's Christmas Eve. That's right. It's Christmas Eve. Santa, he's got something he's got to do. And ta- it's time to get dressed. Oh, it's Santa. He's just, in the sh- he's just in the bathroom. The guy needs to get dressed. His animals are telling him to hurry up. It's a cute little story. I love that. My- Again, I apologize. I was wrong. Let's go to the next page now. So here we are. I'm not 100% sure what's going on here. All I see is it looks like these clothes don't fit. I mean, look at this. He's obviously struggling. Most likely, he stole these clothes. He probably broke into a store, grabbed as much stuff as he could, like we're watching on the news lately, and ran out with it. And now he's just here in his home trying it on. Nothing fits, right? If you come over here, see see on this side, you have uh, this belt. Doesn't even come close up, and he can't even get it connected. And... What's even worse is he's brought his pets into his crimes. That's part of his gang right there. This dog's been stealing mittens. This cat's been stealing a hat. This is what you're, if this was your next door neighbor, would you want your kids being around this person? 
stealing clothes, doing heaven only knows what, probably selling it. Let's see what the story says. Left leg in and the right. Oh, he's just getting dressed. It says here, wear your coat. Now belt it tight. That's right. He's Santa. He only wears these clothes once a year. He's getting them out of the closet and putting them on. Again, I was wrong. I apologize. Let's move on to the next page. See what it says here. All right, though, this one is interesting. I don't know what's going on here. Okay, let me just point some things out. Obviously, something's going down. He knows he's caught. He knows the jig, the jig is up, right? He's done. And by the way, I think it has something to do with what's in this sack. I don't know what's in there. It could be the clothes that he stole. It could be the drugs that he's dealing. It could be elves. I don't know what's going on. There's, there's bodies in that bag, most likely. Something, look at the fear in their eyes. They, look, they just look like, can you believe what he just did? Yeah, you're going to jail too, most likely. And here's why. Look what it says. Santa's ready. For what? And then it says, oh no. Oh no, that's right. Because look at the cops have shown up. <laughs> right? The DC cops have shown up. He's done. They're there and they want to know what's going on and what's in that bag. They're, they've had enough. They've heard all, all the neighbors have called. They all have been complaining about this guy. They have had enough. Let's see what it says. Oh, no, he's got to go. Oh, that's right. This is a potty book for little kids. It's a cute little Santa potty book for little kids. I apologize. I was wrong on that one again. Let's see. Let's go to the next one. Let's see what we got here. All right, well, this one's obvious. I don't even have to explain this one. We can all see what's going on here. This is Santa, and he is booking it because he's running from the cops, <laughs> right? He's running so fast, his clothes are coming off. The clothes that he stole... He's running from the popo and he's trying to get away. He's going to go flush all the drugs down because he doesn't want to deal with it. That's why he's running to the bathroom. I'm telling you, you're going to see it on the news later. You don't believe me, but I'm telling you, it's going to be there. Next one. Next page. <clears throat> it says, phew. Or that's better, right? <laughs> Look at his face. So it seems so content, but the reality is, He's barely standing. I'm starting to think that Santa, this guy who calls himself Santa, he's drunk. <laughs> he's, or, or he's on his, or he's dipping to his own supply. Because look at, he's barely like standing. And then over here, look how he's like putting that on. He's like feeling the buttons and the fabric. Like he's, he's in a whole different mind space. He's like, this is, feels so good. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> And then over here, look how involved he is with that mitten. First of all, adult men have at least gloves that have fingers they can use. They got to, you know, snow plow the driveway or something. They need to have full uh, flexibility, not a mitten. Who wears a mitten? And why is he like, just like, yes, this is so nice. I don't know what he's on, but I'm concerned for him and his health. I should probably call somebody. And again, he's got his, his pets right there as his little servants. Doing, what they, doing whatever he wants. Let's read what the story says. <clears throat> it's getting late. Hurry, hurry. Getting late? Why is it getting late? For what? A drug deal? I don't know what's going on. Oh, it's getting late. You have a very important date. Does it have something to do with the fact that he's Santa Claus? Most likely, yes. Again, I apologize. I was wrong on that one. Let's see what this one is. This is the last page right here. Hurry, Santa, off you go. Ha, ha, ha. You know why he's laughing? I'll tell you why he's laughing. Because once again, Santa goes off on a multi-day adventure, not telling anybody, and he doesn't feed his pets. They're crying out, please don't do this again. We're hungry. You don't feed us. You never let us out. Poor pets are crying out. He's most likely whipping these reindeer. He's not treating them with respect. Again, Peter would be very upset at this, at this particular juncture. This man is flying around. What does it say here? Hurry, Santa. Off you go. Oops. Off you go. Merry Christmas. 
ho, ho, ho. I was wrong on that one too. So here's the thing, guys. We want to be judged by our intentions, by what we do and why we do what we do, right? We, we know why we did it. We, we were fearful or we, we felt like we had no other option or we really wanted to help, but it just didn't work. We want people to judge us by our intentions, but the way that we judge other people is by their actions, and where this ties together with why I just did that, hopefully I didn't offend you guys too much, but the reason why that I did that is because when we don't have all of the details of somebody else's story, somebody else's reasoning and their actions and their words, when we just see what they've done, but we don't know all the details of it, those gaps our mind can't handle. And so what do we do by default without even thinking of it? We fill in the gaps of other people's stories. And we normally fill it in with bad things. We assume that this is what they meant. We assume that that's what they were thinking. That's what they were feeling. When we don't know all the details, by default, we fill in the gaps. And it says in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, that Satan is the accuser of the brethren, which means when we're filling the gaps in, we are filling those gaps in with accusations. Because I don't know why they did that or what they were thinking about or what their motive was. And so all I can do is assume that it's something bad. What literally what Satan does, he whispers in our ears and he says, they did that because they hate you. Or she did that because she wants to ruin your life. Or that group said that because they don't care and they're just a bunch of bigots. Or this person in that organization in this church. Satan whispers in our ears accusations about other people. And so when we can't see the full story, like the, like the story I just read here, things that are covered up and we don't know the details, we just start assuming the worst things. But love says that we should expect the best. Literally, in the word, when we love somebody, it means that we are to expect the best of that person. Yeah, but they've hurt me and they've done it so many times that I got to keep putting myself in a position to be hurt. No, you don't. You can have boundaries and you should. You can put distance between you and that person. You don't have to be close to them and they can hurt you every single moment of every single day just so that you can be loving towards them. You can say, I need there to be boundaries in place. And while you're doing that, expect the best because you have no idea what God's speaking to their heart. You have no idea how he's been ministering and what he's been doing to line things up to bring about repentance in their heart. So many times we answer the story and write the story for God while he's trying to write it himself. And we put periods where there's not supposed to be periods. And we put bold lettering where God doesn't want there to be bold lettering. We fill the blanks in and God's going, you're not writing the same story that I'm writing. Let me write this story. It's important that I do. Romans chapter 12, verse 17. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. It says, be careful to do what is right. The reality is you can be 100% right. You can have all the truth on your side. You can be 100% right and be 100% wrong at the exact same time. All the truth, but the way that you deliver that truth and live that truth and speak that truth, you can be doing it in such a way where it causes more division, lack of harmony, lack of peace, and it causes harm to other people. You can be 100% right and wrong at the exact same time. If you're loving somebody, loving a loving person seeks to protect the relationship, not win at all costs. Hear me on that. If your relationship is focused around you winning every argument, always being right, full of pride and conceit, that is not love. Love seeks to build up, to encourage, and to strengthen the relationship. If it's a good relationship, obviously if it's not one, then maybe you have to walk away from it. I will be honest with you, some of you, myself oftentimes included, we have forgotten in the pursuit of truth, we have forgotten to demonstrate mercy and grace. Let's not be followers of Jesus that don't show Jesus' mercy, grace, and love to those around us. Last verse, Romans chapter 12, verse 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. 
The reality is it's not always possible. But it says, even though it's not always possible to be in full peace, you still have a responsibility. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, which means there's things that depend on you, live at peace with everyone. I'll put it this way. It takes two people to reconcile a relationship. Both people coming together and saying, we need to make this right. It takes two people to reconcile a relationship. It doesn't often happen. But by the grace and miraculous power of God, it can happen. Even though it doesn't always happen, it only takes one person to demonstrate forgiveness and love. And that person's you. It takes two to reconcile. We're always so focused on, but if I forgive them, if I allow them to keep doing this, then they're just going to keep hurting me. It takes two to reconcile. It doesn't always happen, but it's a, good, it's a good thing to put your heart towards. But at a minimum, it takes one person, you, to demonstrate love and forgiveness. Even if you have to do that your entire life while they continue to torpedo you, continue to de demolish your character, continue to do everything they can to dismantle your life, it takes one person, you, to demonstrate love and forgiveness. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers. When the whole world is running around without relational peace, you be a peacemaker, one that causes peace by your words that bless and not curse. By controlling your thought life, not allowing your thoughts to fill in the blanks. In fact, when there are blanks in the story, those are indicators for you to pray. Lord, I don't know why they did what they did, but I pray for them. Blessing over their heart, over their rest, over their finances, their home, their relationships, over everything that they put their hands to. God, would you surround them? I know that hurting people hurt other people. That's cliche, I know, but it's true. And so if they hurt me, Lord, that means there's a whole bunch of blanks in their story that I'm going to be praying over because I want them to receive the mercy and grace from God that I have. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Please stand up. I want to remind you of this last important thing. This is very important. Your life is too short and your calling is too great for you to be throwing your peace away. Again, we're not victims. Peace didn't just get sucked away from you. It didn't get robbed from your household. When offenses come, you might be offended in a moment, but then submit that to God and walk away from it and choose to let God deal with that. You don't have to be an offended Christian that lives your life in offense. Your life is too short. God's amazing calling over you is too great for you to be throwing away your peace. Let other people do what they're going to do. As much as it depends on you, be a blessed peacemaker. Lord, I pray for everyone that's here. This is so much easier said than done. So God, I just ask that you be with them. Lord, if there's people that we need to forgive, reveal those people to us. God, help us to not walk as just mirrors of our society. When someone does something bad to us, we just reflect it right back to them. Lord, help us to cover and to bless and to pass. Lord, help us to be people that speak well of and minister your prophetic grace over their lives, literally calling into existence in their life what does not right now exist. Lord, help us to have faith to believe that your goodness and your life and your kindness can bubble up out of those people, that they're not a lost cause, they're not our enemy, and they're not a people that have so offended you that they are unable to be saved. Lord, in humbling ourselves now with no pride, we say you have forgiven us so much, so we choose to forgive others of their debt. God, we love you. We thank you, God, for your kindness towards us. You're full of peace and patience. Lord, help us to demonstrate that to the world around us. We thank you for this. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.